Beanie fans and welcome. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Now if you haven't been following along, a couple of weeks ago Han Beanie reached out to me and said do you want me to do a critique video of your TT position? And he pointed out a few things which he really didn't agree with, mainly kind of the semi high hands position that pretty much is ubiquitously adopted in the TT and triathlon scene now. And he said actually he doesn't reckon it's very fast. So I said absolutely please enlighten me, here's a few pictures, I'm ready for a reaming, don't hold back, go in as hard as you like. And actually, he was pretty kind. He didn't roast me too badly, he didn't roast my position or my bike or my kit choice too badly, but there were a few things that really piqued my interest about what he said about the position. So anyway, I think Hambini was anticipating a response video, so here it is, here's my reply to his comments, and also in this video is more of an in-depth look at, at how I perceive the art of TTing and what you need to understand and what you need to consider to be a good time trialist. So without further ado, in typical fashion, we're gonna use PowerPoint. I hope that doesn't put you off too much, but it, it's really helpful getting the points across and it helps me do some drawings and stuff like that about the aero side and the biomechanics side. So let's jump in now. So welcome back then. This is a little presentation on the high hands versus low hands debate that we've got going on with Hambini. I call it TT Bike Fit, high, high hands versus low hands. Also the Hambini reaming, reaming. Time to get my own back. Let's do the Peak Talk TT analysis. Let's have a little look at what Hambini did. This is his video. I'll put it in the link description somewhere or up above or on screen when I figure out how to do that. Before I introduce Hambini, let's have a quick look at how he introduced me. Just so it's fair. So he contacted me with some pictures and we thought we'd do this. I'm sure there's going to be a reaction video to this, which is going to be equally full of piss taking. So uh, he's obviously a much better engineer, TT cyclist and YouTube personality than me. Whereas my background is fitting shelves that I got from Ikea. Wow, that was really nice of him. I, I must admit, I did not expect that considering, you know, his track record. That was... Thanks, it's so nice. So, let's meet Hambini. He's introduced me, now I'm going to introduce him. He claims to be an engineer. Okay, fine. Claims to have an aerospace or fluid dynamics background. Expert in aerodynamics, apparently. He makes one piece BBs that will ream the fuck out of your bike frame as soon as you put them in if the bike frame isn't absolutely perfect. He's viciously patriotic. He claims to be French, but he also loves Germany. So he's somewhere stuck between the Rhine and the Rhone. He's probably been watching too many old World War II videos on the Western Front. And like I said, he claims to be a fluid dynamics expert. But I've actually got a load of mates that work in the aerospace and defense industry in the UK, you know, Southwest, Bristol, Filton. And I know some sources close to Hambini, and yes, he is fluid dynamics, but not in the way you'd expect it. He's actually a plumber. So this is his van in the Rolls-Royce car park down in Bristol, and he's kept busy. He has a lot of work. Just in clogging the, the toilets of his own bullshit, mainly. This is actually his van. It was uh, photographed by a friend of mine. Interesting number plate there. And if you want to get in contact with him, uh, that's his email address. See on the side of the van there. We've done the intros. Let's look at what I believe were the holes in Hambini's uh, analysis and what I believe are like the pillars of TT. So first of all, I would say three main things, comfort, power, and aero. Now Hambini really addressed aero only, but massively other important things are comfort and power. Now, in the middle here, I've done a couple of little like diagrams to show you that if you, if you had 100, let's say you had 100 beans, 100 magic beans to spend, how would you distribute them? among these three pillars of TT, aerodynamics, power, or comfort. And personally, I would change that balance, or how I would spend those beans, depending on the distance of the event. So a 10 mile, a 25, and 50 mile TT. The physiological requirements are very different. Um, we'll come on to that later about the cyclist critical power curve and stuff like that. But a common denominator in both of them, or in all of them, sorry, is that aero is the most important. And I've gone through that by, you know, weighing up the physiological costs of power and comfort and stuff. But in every single case, aero is right. So he was, he was kind of right to base most of his analysis on aerodynamics, but comfort and power do really matter, particularly in the longer distance TTs. And I would say that I focus mainly on longer distance uh, team time trials or individual time trials. I don't really have a 10 miler that we do in our club. Um, I think our shortest one is well, it's over 10 miles anyway, and we normally do sort of much longer ones than that. So I really do take into account power and comfort. I have to do it more than if I was doing a 10 miler. Um, some other, th you know, things you need with TTs, mental strength, which is super important, confidence. 
adrenaline, handling of the bike, not so important maybe on a not technical course. Rolling resistance is important as you go faster, drivetrain is important, and braking and mass. But all those things are kind of a lot easier to get right. Um, they are more objective, whereas aero and all these other stuff is, is, is basically hard because you can't see it. And just before we go, go ahead, um, your power output is proportional to your CDA times the cube of the speed. Now, the power, the, f the drag force is the V squared, but the power, if we're talking power, is V cubed. And we will just point out now again that the CDA does not remain constant. And that's one thing Tambini quite, what, quite rightly uh, pointed out in his video. The CDA does change as you go faster. And in general, this coefficient of drag goes up with increasing velocity or, or Reynolds number. These are the kind of three things I will address in, in this analysis and, and I'm going to talk about the art of TTs as I see it and I do really focus on comfort and power as well as aerodynamics. Let's look at what's actually happening when you're doing a TT. So if we just take into account aero power or aerodynamics on its own for a minute and like I said we've assumed a constant coefficient of drag which is a, it's an assumption, it doesn't always happen because as you go faster the coefficient of drag changes but anyway you can see that as you add power in terms of um, going faster on a, on a bike, it's really diminishing returns because of the, the cube relationship with velocity. So you can see as you go from 200 to 400 watts, your increase in, in speed is not, is not huge. And, and further on, going from sort of 800 to 1000 watts is not, it's diminishing returns. So you need to find where on your critical power as a cyclist, where your best returns are on this graph and yes you can say oh best bang for the buck is right down the bottom of the line but you're not going to win any TTs going at 10 or 20 k's an hour so it's such a fine balance between completely blowing out on a TT by overpowering and trying to bring your airspeed up too high and not giving enough and it, it that's why it's an art it's, it really is an art it, you can't see air unless you're Adrian Newey you can't see it so it is very it comes with a lot of testing and the best TTs have done a lot of testing, they've done a lot of testing over different courses, a lot of different distances and a lot of different positions. And you're saying, am I better off like training to, to increase my FTP by 10% or am I better off focusing on my position to decrease my CDA by 10%? 100% focus on your CDA. If you're a moderately well trained cyclist like a club rider, trying to increase your um, critical power by 10% or your FTP by 10% I would say if you're moderately trained is impossible. You're not going to get that massive jump. If you're a newbie and you're just starting out and you've never and you don't know what an FTP is, then probably yeah, you can increase that by 10%. But if you're moderately trained, you're riding, you know, 5, 6, 10 hours a week, I would say it's impossible without the use of some exotic uh, substances, you can't increase your FTP by 10%. Maybe 5% is a good thing to aim for. So it's much easier to reduce your CDA by 10%. And when it comes to velocity, the, the result of velocity that these uh, gains are going to give you, power and CDA are both like linear terms in the equation. They're cube rooted but they're together, so they have the same effect. So increasing your uh, power by 10% or decreasing your CDA by 10% is going to have the same effect in terms of your result of velocity. So if you feel like you're, you're kind of at, at the limit of your power, time to work on CDA. It has a very small physiological cost to work on your CDA. It just requires a bit of understanding um, and actually not much expenditure because CDA, the, the bulk of the CDA or the bulk of reducing your CDA comes from your body position. It does not come from kit, bike frames, wheels. Like the difference between two bikes, two like high end TT bikes or even a low end TT bike is so small. The massive gains from your bluff body, which is your, your, your legs, your torso, your head, and your arms. Unfortunately, we're not streamlined shapes, and they're the worst things for the airflow. So, focus on CDA. It's easier to get a 10% gain in that than it is to add 10% of power. And like I'm saying, um, to just to back this up, this is a typical critical power curve for a you know a moderately trained cyclist. And don't forget the log scale on the x-axis. So the x-axis is obviously the scale isn't linear. So this really goes to show that if you're trying to add, let's say, 10%, let's say your, your FTP is 400 watts and you're trying to add, get up to 440 by adding 10%, that on the graph is going to mean you can only do that power for such a small amount of time because 
the way the, the human body works, it, it doesn't add power and time linearly. So to add 10% onto your critical power, it's doable, but your the duration of which you can hold that power is is tiny, um, because that's the way the critical power curve. If you don't know how your critical power curve looks like, you can get it from Training Peaks, uh, Strava, Premium, or there's a great app online called Elevate, which is a Chrome plugin, which basically is a ripoff of uh, Strava Premium. Actually, I think it's a little bit better. So it's a Chrome plugin. Install that on Chrome. Go to Strava. Run the sync and you'll get this critical power curve and it will give you your, your, your power you can hold for certain durations and you can plot it over different time periods, you can plot it over all time, but it's great. It's a great tool to say, right, if I know I've got to do a 30 minute coming up, a 30 minute TT coming up, you can look at that and see, right, how much roughly, how much power you, you can expect to hold for 30 minutes. So, I've said the three pillars independently are power, aerodynamics and comfort, but, Power and comfort and CDA aerodynamics are actually all intertwined. So changing one does affect the other, but the, the rate of change between them is slightly different. And I would say for long distance TTs, like if you're doing a 50 mile or even 25 mile TTs, your critical power from the slide before is gonna be low because no one can hold their one hour, two hour power that they can do for 20 minutes. So you know that you're gonna to have to sacrifice some power. You're really gonna to have to drop your power when you start on that TT you'll know, right, I know I'm capable of doing this, I know I'm capable of smashing like 450 watts for five minutes, but you need to, you need to get into your head, you're not gonna be able to do that for two hours or one hour, so what you really need to focus on for the longer TTs is comfort and error, and that's something that, um, particularly comfort that Hanbini didn't really pick up on, I'm gonna talk about it in my video. And really the last thing you need to focus on for a longer TT is your power, because the, the speed will come through your position. It won't come from, from your power in a longer TT. And luckily, a good point is that power and comfort in a position are often mutual. They, also, they are often come together, so you don't have to trade one off for the other. So let's get into the justification part of my position and let's talk more in general about all TT positions. And if you're get, getting into TTs, I mean, I'm, let's, let's be fair, I'm not an aerodynamics expert. I'm an engineer, a mechanical engineer, but I do know a little bit about aerodynamics because I have studied it in the past but it's all conjecture on my part, and I will ask Hambini to uh, validate or, or, or kind of critique my, my analysis. First of all, the helmet. He said that the helmet choice for me was not optimal because I had basically, let's turn my, my pointer on. Ah, one second, right. He said I had a, a big void behind the helmet which was gonna cause the air to detach around here and separate and then not stay attached down my back. And ideally you want the air to stay attached to the back as long as possible. Now based upon the speed that I'm riding at, which is around 12 meters per second or 40 something kilometers an hour, uh, I've approximate the Reynolds number to be in like a transitional flow situation here anyway. It's not gonna be purely laminar. It would only be purely laminar if I was riding much, much slower and had a much smaller head. Anyway, if you're interested in Reynolds number, you can look that up on YouTube somewhere else. But I'm not sure how attached this flow is going to be anyway. So having this tiny void here, I'm not sure what it's going to do. I, realistically, I'm not sure I can get the flow to be attached all the way down my back. But I'll let him pick up on that. Um, and he said, a helmet with a longer tail which fills the void in between the back of my head and my, and my back would be much better. And I completely agree. But I think the Giro, this is a Giro air ahead, I think it's a very good... Um, long distance helmet because if you time average the whole TT and the whole situation where I'm moving my head and at the end of the TT you might be, I might be getting really tired and start to look down, I would be really penalised with a long tail helmet. As soon as you put your head down with a long tail helmet you basically create a massive air break which is terrible for aerodynamics and I think if you're on a longer distance TT you need to move, you do need to move your head about a bit, you you've got, might be got traffic conditions you need to worry about, roundabouts and a shorter tail helmet works quite well. So that's why I've gone for this. Like I said, yeah, short distance one, I would go for a better integrated helmet like a laser wasp or a POC or something, but there's a high penalty if you're not really disciplined. Uh, on the right here, a British rider called Dan Barnett, I think he is, he's a botrel rider. It's got a laser wasp and that's very well integrated on his back and then you can see what happens here if you look down with a long tail helmet. I think this is uh, John Archibald or Dan Bigham, I don't know who it is, but it's rare to see them messing up 
and this is the problem with a long tail helmet if you don't have high discipline and keeping it down on your back. Anyway, so that's why I've stuck with the Giro. It's not a bad helmet. This is one of the guys I ride with from my club. He rides most of the time with his head looking straight down and he would be penalised in any aero helmet. So he just wears a normal road helmet and that probably suits him better because he, he, he basically never looks up. Um, now, Rowan Dennis, one of the best TTers of our time, arguably. Um, he loves the Giro aero head and he makes it work because there's no void there between the back of his head and his, his, his back because he has this kind of weird hunch that it gives his upper back. Uh, I don't know if he does that on purpose or it's just part of his physiology, but this weird hunch kind of fills that void and hopefully stops the air detaching behind the helmet. But then because of the hunch, he gives himself quite hard, a quite high departure angle. So he might be asking the air to do more work and it actually might separate earlier up his back than it would if his back was flatter. If his back was flatter, he might have a departure angle and the, and the flow, flow separation starts around here. But as he is, he's got quite a steep curve in that back and the air might have trouble to flow over that. But I'm not sure, that's just conjecture. But it won't probably separate at the back of the helmet like Hambini reckons it's going to do with me. Anyway, uh, number two. So it was critical of my hands and forearm position, and which, which really got me going because the kind of higher hands, higher stack uh, position seems to be universally adopted on track and in TTs and it seems to be faster for pretty much everyone. And he was very critical and said that, you know, a lower hand position is better. He didn't go into too much detail about why, and I'm going to try and add my theories about why. But I don't think my hand position is like full praying mantis, because if I've got my hands in front of my helmet like this, my helmet is designed to be a streamlined shape. My hands aren't a streamlined shape. My arms and my hands are more of a bluff body. So I can't expect the air to stay attached around my hands and arms. So why would I put them in front of a streamlined shape? If I've got a nicely designed helmet that's a teardrop shape, which, which the Giro is, I want that to be hitting you know, the free stream clean air or clean-ish. I know it's outside and everything's gonna be turbulent. We know ad nauseum from Hambini that that's how it is outside. But why would I ruin the chance of air staying attached on my helmet and on my back by putting my hands in front of it? That's why I don't do the full brain mantis position. So I do have my hand, my arms a bit lower and I make sure they don't get in the way of the helmet from, from the free stream. Now, there's nothing fundamentally aerodynamic about why I choose the higher hand or slightly tipped up arm position. It's more of a, a biomechanics thing. It allows me to take tension from the traps and tension off the shoulders and basically sink my head down like a turtle. There's nothing, there's nothing I'm expecting my arms or my, the angle of my arms to do fundamentally to the airflow. Um, I, I don't think that's, that's why I do it. I do it because if I find that my arms are slightly higher with my wrists higher than my elbows, I can really dip my head. And the head, as we know, probably, apart from the front wheel, is, is the most important thing. So it's more of an enabling position for the head rather than anything fundamentally like aero. Like, I'm not expecting the whole front end of my arms and my head to act like a nose cone. I think some people do expect that, but actually that's probably gonna be worse than getting your arms out of the way because you want to keep your, hel your helmet as a streamlined shape and hopefully the flow can stay attached over it. So what I'm trying to do here is get the back of my helmet in line with my back. Now someone who's counter trend here would be Matt Bottrell, a strong TT rider from the UK, and enables himself to keep a low hand position and a low head. He must have a very flexible neck, flexible uh, back of the neck musculature, and he can, he can manage to do both. But I would say in general that's not so common to be able to do both comfortably. Now the other thing, uh, my response to the critical high hands position is, Habini said that you, know, you need to get your hands basically and your forearms as flat and as low to the front wheel as possible. And feasibly I'm too tall to do that because I would really close up my hip angle too much. And my hip angle is like my engine, basically. If I'm closing my hip angle, I see that as like putting the air restrictor on my engine. It re I do, and I've tested this a lot outside and on the turbo trainer, I do notice a massive drop off in power when I start to close the hip angle. But we'll go, we'll go into that in a minute. But from what I think Hambini was getting onto about um, being low to the front wheel and trying to stay with the forearms as low as possible. And shorter riders can exploit this. Is if, let's say we have a, a, a flow coming from the right to the left here of, of air, let's say it's 45 kilometers an hour, uh, that V1 and a pressure, uh, an air pressure of P1. Now what happens when that, that what we call free stream air hits, hits the bike? We end up with uh, some 
points of stagnation, so where basically the airflow again essentially gets stopped and the pressure rises and the pressure is high pressure air. And then we, if we're lucky, we get some attached flow, or even if it's turbulent attached flow, where the pressure of the air and the velocity, the, pl the pressure decreases and the velocity might go up. Now this could happen over my back, hopefully, if the air, air is attached that's come off the helmet, but we get these high pressure areas um, around the front of the helmet, the hands and the front wheel. And I call, we call these stagnation points, where the air is basically held up before it moves either way, and the, and the pressure is very high. Now, anything in this picture that's um, not blue is higher pressure than what's coming in from the free stream flow. So the, the red, the orange, are oh, these are like ISO contours or ISO pressure lines that I've drawn. And they show that in front of me, even before I've got there, I've raised the pressure of the air before it's hit me. It's because the air, the air is all connected to each other. So I'm creating these layers through the air of, of, um, of high pressure, basically, um, almost like a almost like a little bow wave, and they emanate out in front of me. And if they're higher pressure, the velocity in those regions is actually reduced. So if the velocity out here at V1 is 45 kilometers an hour. The velocity in these um, higher pressure areas has actually been reduced and it's slightly slower than the free stream velocity. So parts of my body, if I can get it into these regions, parts of my body will see less drag because it will see lower speeds and higher pressures. Now what I think Hambini was getting onto, I might be wrong, but if you're really compact and you can get as front if you can get as close to the front wheel as possible, you can get some parts of your arms and your upper arms inside these higher pressure, lower velocity areas. So they, they won't see the high speed air, which is gonna give you the highest drag. They'll see a slight reduction in air speed and thus reducing the drag on those parts. And I think that shorter riders who can get very low to the front wheel can exploit this. They can, also, they can almost get inside those areas of reduced pressure. But feasibly, I'm, you know, I'm six foot five, I can't, I can't get that low because it really closes my hip angle and, and and fucks up basically all the biomechanics. I have to deal with that between my, he my head and my hands. I can't feasibly get into this bubble of the front wheel. But like I said, shorter riders, this is Jonathan Castrovieco, one of the best modern TTers out there. And he's, he's, a, he's a small guy, so he's not got the biggest power, but he can really, I think, exploit this part of aerodynamics where he might be able to get his head, some of, even some of his head, but some of his arms and his handlebars for sure, inside this um, this lower airspeed than free stream um, and higher pressure than free stream uh, bubble basically. But taller riders can't so we have to work on that. We have to work on our arms and our head as a separate entity. But if you're really sure and you can get really close to the front wheel, you can really benefit off the front wheel hitting the air first and reducing the, airspeed, the local airspeed around you so the rest of you creates less drag. But for me, that's not feasible because of the biomechanics side. So it's, it really is all a balance. But anyway, I'm not gonna go too much into this because I could be completely wrong. Um, now finally, I've said, I've said before that aero across all the distances is pretty much the most important thing, but you do still need comfort and comfort generally is mutual with power in a position. So I do, especially, I, I actually recovering from a back injury. I had a herniated uh, disc in my back. So I am looking for a comfortable and powerful position. So I do have this kind of bias for the biomechanics because I've done a lot of testing with seat height, seat tube angle and crank left and stuff and what that does to my critical power. Anyway, so I've done this in another video, a really long video on crank length and basically treating the uh, frame and the rider as a four bar mechanism and looking at the acceleration velocity profiles of the different parts of our limbs. So the femur and the shin and the crank and everything. And I've done a lot of I've done a lot of study into this, and I'll put a link to that video in the description somewhere or up here, and you can see the effect of seat height, seat tube angle, and crank length. Now, if we treat the uh, femur as basically a rocker, it has a reciprocating motion; it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down. To inhibit fatigue, I try and smooth out that velocity profile and acceleration profile as much as possible. And in that video, which you can have a look at if you've got time, we went through a number of different scenarios where we adjusted crank length, seat tube angle and stuff, and we managed to come up with these different accelerate. This is a bit of code that I, I put into Python from a four bar mechanism theory. And I came up with velocity profiles for some different cases. And I found that slight variations in seat height and hip angle 
which essentially is affected by the front end. If the front end's too low, I'm going to lower the hip angle. Really makes a ma massive difference on peak femur velocities and accelerations. And I've kind of come up with my optimum for that. So, like I said, I really do have that bias for biomechanics. And Hambini didn't really address that in his video. But he, he, he admitted to that. He admitted to that. He said, he said, I'm not an expert. And I'm not an expert in biomechanics. I'm just an engineer that has an interest in it. Um, anyway, you need to determine your own flexibility, your own requirements, and your own critical power based in different positions. Um, if someone, if you're going for a TT bike fit and the guy says, um, what's your FTP? There's no point saying, right, my FTP is um, 360 on, on my road bike, you know, when I'm climbing on the, on the, on the tops, because that is not going to be achievable, or you, if, you're, if you're lucky it is, but for most people it's not achievable on, on the TT bike. So if you're a real keen time trialist, you need to get on your uh, turbo trainer, put a camera at the side of you, square onto the side of you, hold that position, do your 20 minute test, and then look at your power, and then make adjustments in that position and film it every time. Film it every time to make sure at the end of the test your head's not popping up. If you think you've got a great position that you've obtained from like a wind tunnel, or track testing, out, even if it's outside testing, then if you say, right, my CDA is 0.18, um, and it goes to 0.22 at the, at, in the last couple of miles of your TT. Is that is that a good position? It's better to have a you know a, a CDA of 0.2 and be able to hold it throughout the duration of your 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 event. So in terms of biomechanics, you really need to determine your own flexibility and requirements. Like this is a this is a picture of me doing yoga, right? Uh, I have very flexible hamstrings and hips, but looking at this you'd think I'd be fine to ride you know with the, the TT bars just on the front wheel and just above the front wheel but I can't because I find the extra tension it creates in the front of the leg like the quadriceps really limits the power so unfortunately you can't just go to yoga and do your flexibility and say right I can do anything you need to test it you need to test it in position test it be hard on yourself do a critical power test on the turbo trainer and see if it's comfortable Anyway, final point he mentioned, disc wheel, he said that's great. Tool, he said, for some reason he said for tool riders, it's, tool riders it's vital. I'm not convinced. I've got all my PBs, and this could be coincidence, it could be just on the day I had better legs, but I've got my PBs on a lot of the courses that I do regularly without the rear disc wheel. Um, I tend not to, or I tend to take the data from manufacturers of disc wheels with a pinch of salt because it's very hard to know what the air is doing once it's got to the back wheel. It's got the wake width from your lower legs and the wake from your upper legs and the weights from your arms and everything's spinning and it's very turbulent and probably not attached when it gets to the disc wheel. So what is the disc wheel actually doing? Um, it's hard to simulate in CFD and for me like there are a load of compromises with a disc wheel. Uh, first of all it makes the back end of the, the bike super stiff like in vertically in plane so you lose a bit of like uh, bump compliance, you lose a bit of braking traction and if you really like like to carve turns to save time, like like personally I do on a TT, I try and uh, corner as hard as possible. It is quite reluctant to to turn. It, it tries to stand up in the corners, and I prefer like a normal clincher clincher wheel. But yeah, it's very hard to simulate. I'd like to see some more data put out on, on disc wheels. They sound great. Like when you go past someone, and you clunk a gear. They sound absolutely awesome. But for me, I'm still not convinced. I'm on the fence with the disc wheel. Anyway, thanks for watching. Put the comments down below. I'm sorry this has gone on for a long time, but this is my take on the art of time trialing. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers.